Good morning. Welcome to Foothills. It's good to see everybody out there. Uh, man, having some technical difficulties here. Hey, as always, uh, let's stand and sing together. Be 
As we get going in our service, it's time for everybody to practice their extrovert muscles. Uh, so let's do that. Let's uh, make a friend, find an old friend, and we'll get back to it in a minute. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Okay. <laughs> Great job. You guys exercised your extra muscles, muscles so hard. And now it's time to take a break. You know, this time of year, it really brings out the hypocrite in me because I'll wear this and I'll drink a pumpkin spice latte, but I'll look you in the eye and say, I hate fall. So anyway, you guys didn't get that. That's fine. Welcome to Foothills. My name is Emily, and I'm so happy to see so many of you here this morning. If you are new with us, we would love to know that you are here. You can do that by filling out a Connect card. You can either fill out the blue card that's in the seat in front of you, or you can use the QR code to fill it out on our website, or you can fill it out back at the welcome desk at the end of the service. So many different options for you. Okay, we've got a lot of announcements because we've got our fall kickoff. All our activities are coming up, so bear with me. Here we go. Number one, women's Bible study is starting back up. Now, remember, we have two sessions for women's Bible study. There's one on Monday nights and one on Wednesday mornings. The Wednesday morning one has child care provided, so if you're a stay-at-home mom with little ones, please come to that Wednesday morning one. Have someone else hold your baby for two hours and get to hang out with adults and have adult conversations. It's the best. 
So it's starting out um, September 11th and 13th for that Monday and Wednesday one. You can register online by going to the women on the ministries section out of our website. It costs 20 bucks for the book. And if you have any more questions, you can reach out to any one of the pastors that you see wandering about the facility. Okay, next up, we have a Women's Weekend coming up as well. The theme is Holy Loved. It's September 29th through October 1st, and it's being held at Washington Family Ranch. So we would love to have as many women from Foothills um, come and enjoy some worship, some teaching, some prayer time, a time to rejuvenate with other women of the faith. Um, so you can sign up again using the QR code. And if you have questions, you can email Sarah Trot. Her email is up there on the screen as well. Okay. And we talked about the women. Now it's time to talk about the men. Men's rafting trip. We talked about this last week as well. September 17th, 1 o'clock to 6 o'clock p.m. And if you can, you can also find sign-up information. I think they have waivers and stuff at the back table back there. So go ahead and check that out at the end of service and give that a look-see. Um, it's ages 11 up. So if you've got a son who really likes to go whitewater rafting, take him along. So it'll be great. If you have questions, you can ask Rob as well. Okay, and now we also have fall family kickoff September 10th. This is a great opportunity if you have some kiddos who are wanting to get to know other kids in their age group, if they want to talk to their small group leaders that they'll have on Sunday mornings. It's just a great time for fellowship to meet other families here at Foothills. So that's going to be from ages birth through fifth grade. So even y'all who have the little ones who might not necessarily have like a formal class, please come and fellowship with other families. There'll be hot dogs too. My son loves hot dogs. So you should all love hot dogs too. If you have questions, you can ask Judy um, and her email is there as well. Everyone's email is on the screen. And don't forget that we have our food drive and our food drive is, our last week is going to be next week. So it's running through next week. Um, the barrels that you can drop off your donations are out in the foyer. And you'll also find posters that have the top 10 most wanted foods. So stuff like peanut butter, canned tuna, canned chili, all that kind of stuff. You'll find those kind of throughout the building as well. Um, so make sure that you make a note of that with your grocery shopping and drop them off next Sunday. And finally... Two services is starting up. I've loved having our 10 o'clock service, but you know it'll also be nice to sleep in a little bit even more. Come to the 1045 service. Um, but on September 10th, everything starts September 10th, so if you're wondering when something's starting, September 10th, probably. Um, remember that our live stream is at the 9 o'clock service, and then our 1045 service will have our children's programming. So plan out your mornings accordingly. So this week and next week are our last two weekends of uh, 10 o'clock services. So just be prepared for that. If you come at 10 o'clock on September 10th, it'll just be kind of awkward because it'll be just people milling about. Or you might walk into the middle of service, which would be fine, but it'd be a little awkward. Okay. And that is all we have for today. Thank you for bearing with me through all of those. Um, here at Foothills, our mission is to glorify God, make disciples, and reflect God's love. And one of the ways we do that is through giving. Giving allows us to be able to do our best possible work in terms of family programming, things like putting together women's Bible studies and family kickoffs. So if you feel led and if you call Foothills your home, please consider how the Lord would have you give this morning. Um, we'll have the ushers come forward as well. If you're a visitor, feel, feel no obligation to give. You can just let that basket pass you on by. And um, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Andy. Yeah. I've got my friend Malachi. He's going to help me out with a verse this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, Malachi. <laughs> The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongues of the wise bring healing. Proverbs 12, 18. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Malachi. Uh, who's, who's been on the wrong end of this before? Giving or receiving? Both, both are the wrong end, right? Um, I didn't think that one through before I opened my mouth, but... Um, how easy is it, though, right, in the moment? You guys can start to pass those baskets. Um, how easy is it to, uh, to just snap back and give somebody what we think they deserve? Like, all too easy, right? But on the flip side of that, like, if we, if we think about our tongue, you know, often we are able to just dish it out, or maybe I'm just speaking for myself, right? I can dish it out like nobody and be very thoughtless about my words, but on the flip side, if we put some thought into like using our words for good, not just good for goodness sake, but for God's purposes, right? To speak uh, words of healing and words of truth, 
uh, even a gentle rebuke, into the lives of others. What a powerful force that can be, right, for God's kingdom and his purposes. So uh, if you want to hide that verse in your heart, uh, Judy has got some little coloring pages back there that have that verse on it that you can take. Uh, if you're a kid of any age, no judgment on if you're, you know, over the age of six and like to color. There's a whole adult coloring book industry now, right? So uh, with that, let's stand and let's sing. Let's sing of the, the great things that God has done for us.
Amen. Father, we thank you for the great things that you've done. God, the, the victories that you've won on our behalf, both on the cross and in our daily lives. Father, we pray that we would reflect on that often, God, that we wouldn't be people with our head down horizontally, God, but we would be lifting our eyes to you day by day. God, teach us from your word. Help us to lift our eyes in this time. Help us to hear from our Father who loves us, God. Speak to us. We need you today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. Well, good morning. Hey, my name is Tyler. I'm the lead pastor here. And um, it's good to be in the room together. Man, it's packed in here. Hey. Um, I'm going to do some preaching today. I heard some of you were excited about that. That makes me feel all right. So um, it's been a while, um, but uh, here we go. Uh, let me tell you what's going to happen today, the next couple weeks, and uh, we'll jump into a text today. I'm going to call this uh, Tyler's Sabbatical Musings Part 1. And uh, later this evening, there's an Israel recap trip, uh, trip recap. My wife and I went to Israel in June for three weeks, and I'm going to share some pictures and stories and some insights. Uh, A lot of you are signed up for that, and you have food that will be prepared for you. And if you just think you're just going to come at six, that's fine, but you're going to be in the last of the line, okay? And maybe you'll get food, maybe you won't, okay? But that's at six o'clock this evening. Uh, Next week, I'll do another kind of musings of my sabbatical. For those of you who are new here, uh, I was on break for about three months, and I'm just going to share some things today and next week about uh, what I've been learning or just some insights I've had as I've been on break from pastoring. We'll talk about the mission of Foothills Church. That first Sunday, we're back to two services, and then we're going to actually jump back into the book of Romans and finish that out as we uh, get into our fall. It's a great Great uh, part of the Bible to be in. We'll be in the highly practical, kind of here's how we live out the gospel text as we're in the book of Romans. And so for this morning, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. If you need a Bible, we have our ushers here. They'd love to get one to you. All you have to do is just raise your hand, and they'll come right to you, service right at your seat, and uh, find your place in 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to have all the words up on the screen, but it's always good to have the text in front of you, whether that's on your phone or some kind of smart device, or that's an actual physical paper Bible. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 1 through 10, this is one of those sections that you can't help but just be in awe of who Jesus is. And so I thought, what a great chance for us as a church and for me as I kind of get back into the saddle, so to speak. To focus on Jesus. This is where it starts, though. Uh, he actually starts with you and I personally, and he, he wants you to get rid of some things. And so this is Peter writing to church people just like us. He wrote this many years ago, but there's so much relevancy that it's not just an ancient text that we keep at arm's length. It's actually something we get to inspect with our lives and, and our hearts and heads. And he says, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Let me highlight that, okay? It says, get rid of all of these things. Um, My family and I recently actually sat through someone teaching on this, and he had some some good little quick descriptions of those words and what they mean. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. Um, Malice, that's simply the ill will you might have towards someone else. Now, some of you, I have some people in my family, they like to laugh at me when I stub my toe or run into the corner of, of, a, of a wall or something, and that doesn't mean they're necessarily wishing ill will. Maybe they are. I don't know. Maybe they just walk around going like, what's Tyler going to do next, and how is he going to hurt himself? But you've all been in that situation where someone has done something wrong to you, or you don't agree with the way someone works or their attitude or the things that come out of their mouth. And you can't help yourself but think, I hope they go down. And I hope they go down hard. Some of you Beaver fans out there, you're thinking, I didn't like the Ducks to begin with, but now it's taken me to another level of hatred. (laughs) And oh, if the game this year was only in Corvallis, what would happen? (laughs) Some of you are amening me. How about that? Some Beaver fans out there. All right. That's malice. Deceit. 
being untruthful, right? Bending the truth. Uh, hypocrisy tied into that, right? This idea of pretending to be what I'm not. Uh, envy, wanting what others have. Uh, my friend Mike, who preached last week, if you were here, we spent a lot of time talking about that last week. The fear of missing out or the envy or the good old-fashioned uh, um, uh, wanting what others have and coveting. That's the word I was looking for, coveting what others have. And slander, desire to tear down someone else and ruin their reputation. Uh, you, you might find yourself at least in part struggling with each of those. There might be one that jumps off the page as I kind of give a short definition of those. And if that's true, if you find yourself in that text, I'm going to guess and just, um, I'm going to not just guess, but I'm going to assume that's the Holy Spirit working in your life to say, hey, this is something we want to pay attention to. Because what's the call? It's to rid yourself of all of these things. So here's one sabbatical musing, okay, that I've had. And it's not just this text, but this, this kind of highlights and brings it to the surface for me. Is I must rid myself of these things, malice and deceit and hypocrisy, envy and slander. And I have a couple little sub points for my own, me personally. Um, I just, I believe you, no matter if you're six or 80 and you're in the room or if you're a just figuring out how to talk and figure things out, or if you're finishing your race on life, these things and a whole other host of list of things in the New Testament that the writers of the New Testament put in front of us, they are always uh, in danger of becoming who we are and how we uh, live out our lives. And for me, the setting uh, last few months that has really helped me um, get rid of these things is actually just removing myself from social media completely. So for me, I would put it like this. Social media isn't good for my soul right now. Maybe someday I'll get back on. I've been a month, almost a month back kind of working in the office. We did a staff retreat this last week. It was great. Um, but I can't, like anytime I think about logging into Facebook or reactivating my account, there's something in me that goes, I cannot get back on. I just can't. The question for me, kind of in a Jesus, if I could paraphrase him and put my own spin on it, what good is it for me to gain social media and forfeit my soul? I feel my soul going, do not go back there. Now, that's just me personally. There might be several of you that can go onto social media and not have it affect your soul in the way it did for me, but when I was on social media, those things at the top of the screen there, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander, oh my word, those can rear their heads in all kinds of ways. And it's not like I was online just like ripping people to shreds or anything, but in my heart and in my head, I cannot help myself from practicing those things. I don't think anyone can spend, if you're on Facebook, I don't think you can spend more than two minutes on state and community co connections and think the worst of people, <laughs> especially the unfiltered one. Is that still going, or is that, did that get shut down? I don't know. You can't go through reels over and over again and not have those things affect your life. And this is just on top of the reasons why I got off of social media. I, wasn't, I didn't think any of those things were brewing in my heart. I was just like, I can't focus on so many people that I'm really not even connected to. I want to focus on the people that I see every day, week in and week out, the church family that I belong to, my neighbors that I live in community with, the kids on my, my kids' sports teams and their families, the people that I work with. I just don't think I have the capacity to care for that many people. That was the reason I got off, and now I'm discovering that maybe there's more to it. And my, I think something within me, God helping me sort through it, is like, you can't go back. And so right now, I'm not going back. You won't find me on there. Call me, text me. My phone number's in our directory. You know, take me out for coffee. I'll take you out for lunch, whatever. Let's, let's talk face to face. I can't, I can't right now. So I'm, I must rid myself of those things. Back in the text, verse 2, uh, Peter says, Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. He's saying... This is what I want you to do. I want you to get rid of those things, but I want you to crave pure spiritual milk. Almost, almost uh, universally, people are thinking that, that Peter's talking about the word of God. 
when he's talking about pure spiritual milk. He's not talking about um, people who are um, really infants in their spiritual journey. But he is making a connection saying, just like a baby craves pure, pure spiritual milk, I want you to crave the word of God. I want you to crave the things of God. So you may grow up in your salvation. You've already been saved. I want you to grow up into maturity in your salvation because you've already tasted and seen, you've you've tasted that the Lord is good. So why not keep on drinking from that well? Why not keep sipping from the thing that saved you so that you can keep growing in your salvation? A lot of times when we think of cravings and desire, scripturally speaking, we think this has to do with sinful things. And Peter's not talking about that. We think of things like this. The picture's a little grainy, but this is Edmund. This is a screenshot from The Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe. If you're familiar with, uh, if you're familiar with that scene, he's chowing down on some Turkish delight. And <laughs> what that is a symbol for in the story, or if you've seen the movie, if you're paying attention to the spiritual cues that C.S. Lewis has in that story, is it's a symbol, it's a picture of sin. And what happens when we, when we consume ourselves with passions and desires that are against the ways of God? And so he craves it and he desires it. He, he can't eat enough of it. When he finishes it and he's drinking the hot cocoa, he wants more. That's all he can think about. When he goes back, uh, you know, out of the wardrobe, back into real life, that's all his thoughts are consumed with. And when he gets back into Narnia, that's all he's thinking about. He wants more Turkish delight. What's happening here in our text, though, is Peter is saying, I want you to crave spiritual milk. I want you to crave the things of God. I want you to crave the word of God. I like this picture of this little baby, right? Looking up at a caregiver mom, probably, and wanting just the basic thing in life at that stage. is Just give me some more of that milk. Give me some more of that juice, right, that keeps me going. Looking to God uh, for the things that we need in life. We've tasted and we've seen that the Lord is good, and Peter is calling us back to that, like newborn babies that just can't help themselves but craving the things of God. Be like them. Crave God. Crave his word so you can grow up in your salvation. That's my second musing. I need to crave the word of God. Do you need to crave the word of God? Have you... Uh, been in a season, are you in a season now, or have you been in a season where God's word and your desire to read his word is so far down the list of desires in your life that you skip it, you just have no energy, you have no attention, you have no desire, you can't even muster up the simple prayers that, that I've been trying to muster up is, God, just help me want to read your word and help me know you by reading your word. Help me know myself and the community you've placed me in. Uh, if, if you're like me, you, you probably had seasons, you might be in one now where you just go, I, I look at that picture of the baby and I feel like I'm full grown. I've moved way past milk. I don't even have the craving or the desire. I don't feel the need to crave the word of God. And maybe for you this morning, the simple act might be to just return to God in prayer and say, God, it's not even in me to desire that. Would you create in me the desire to crave after your word and to crave after you? I've tasted you. I've seen that you are good. And I want to grow up in my salvation. Let's go back into the text, okay? And this, this is where Peter gets into kind of beginning to focus on Jesus. As you come to him, He's talking about Jesus right there. The hymn is Jesus. The living stone rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house um, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Check this out. He's describing Jesus as a living stone, a foundational building block that has been rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to God. And he goes on and he says, you also, uses the same language, you're like living stones. You, people of the church, you're being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. You're able to offer spiritual sacrifices. You're offering your life, as Paul says in Romans 12, we'll get into that actually in the fall, living sacrifice 
to God through Jesus Christ. And, and it's, this is all in the context. Don't miss it here. Beginning of the verse, verse 4, it says, As you come to him, this is what happens. As you come to Jesus, the one who is the, the living stone, rejected by men, I mean, the world did not accept Jesus. There were people that were on his side, but no one really accepted Jesus for who he was. That eventually led to his death on a cross. They rejected him. And as you come to the, that rejected stone, Jesus, you are like living stones. You're being built into a spiritual house. You cannot be built into the house of God as his living stones unless you come to God the Father through Jesus. Look at that. Acceptable to God through Jesus. If you ever want to know uh, how a church gets off the mark, starts walking down a crooked path, it's they stop coming to him. They just think we could just do this on our own. If we just figure out how to get someone to play the guitar and look good or have a good haircut, sorry, or you know, get a better building or better programs, that's all fine. But if you miss the first and most important set of com- step of coming to God himself, then you're not building up a spiritual house of God. You're building up something else. And even you personally, or you and your family, are you coming to him? Are you, uh, as, as Peter describes, are you these little living stones that are put into place, being built up into the house of God? This structure some of us think this is a sacred place, and that's fine for you to come in with reverence and respect, and it's probably helpful for you. But this is not the, the structure that, that Peter is talking about. You, the people of God, are the household of God. Okay, here's, here's my next musing. Uh, there's no substitute for being in my local church in person. Now, I might put like a little bit of a right turn coming out of that text, but... Um, I just, I'm just more aware than I have been in a long time because I, I didn't have to go to church for a few months. I wasn't paid to go to church. I've been paid to go to church my whole adult life. <laughs> just think about that. That's kind of weird, right? If I don't come to church, I have to submit a sick day or a vacation day. It's, it's a strange and peculiar life to be a pastor. And if I'm not in a local church body coming to him, God the Father, collectively with other believers, then I don't think there's any chance for me to be being built up into the spiritual house of God. I just don't think it's any... I might be a living stone, but I'm like off to the side. <laughs> and I'm not being used as I should be used or being, uh, not experiencing life as I should experience it. There's just no substitute. Now, a my family and I, we went to a few churches while on sabbatical. We were extremely busy with a bunch of other things other than what we would normally be caught up in at church and all the activities that um, are good at our church and that we get to be a part of. And so sometimes we would make it to a church. We, we hopped uh, kind of primarily two different churches, and sometimes we were busy traveling and whatnot. And there was one part- particular Sunday where um, one of my sons was was playing baseball on a Sunday, and um, half the family was like, eh, church, you know, <laughs> and just to be completely honest, and I was like, I'm, I need to get, I want to get in church, so I dropped my son off at, at this game, went to the church that we had been going to or watching online throughout sabbatical, and uh, the rest of the family said, we'll just watch, we'll watch at home, and uh, we'll do church that way. We've been there, right, the last three years. We've never watched more church than we have in the last three years. And so I'm in, I'm in church, I'm paying attention, we sing a song or two, we do, there's some announcements, kind of like our church, and then I check my phone during announcements, and my family is texting me, they're saying, because they're watching the service that I'm at, and they're saying, we see you, <laughs> we see you. And it wasn't that I was just like one of the heads that they could see, I was kind of front and center, my big bald head. This is my picture. <laughs> this is the picture they sent me. That's me. I'm bigger than the guy on stage. And that's just my head that's bigger than him. Um, we miss church for a lot of things. 
I mean, we went to church, and we, we had some good experiences as families. It was refreshing for me to go and not worry about anything that was happening as far as, like, what do I need to evaluate for next Sunday? It was good for me. It'll be good for me as I kind of get my feet underneath me here to, to remind myself that when I'm sitting over here or over there and I'm worshiping, that I'm just here to worship. And to try to get into that place where I can sing a song and my heart's aligned with the words on the screen, I'm not just thinking about, you know, is the bass turned up loud enough? Or did the projectionist, you know, click fast enough through the slides? Or whatever goes through my mind as, as a leader in the church. I want to mention three primary ways most of us miss church. These are just my own little musings here. Um, the first one, we, we simply become lazy or apathetic. For some, of the, for some of us, that's just the struggle of our life. It's not a church thing. It's, it's what we struggle with in work and chores at home or schoolwork. But some of us, it is particular to going to church. We can be highly dialed in, not lazy or apathetic at work or in community. But when it comes to church, it becomes a real struggle. We aren't lazy or apathetic in other areas, but when it comes to church, we are. Uh, the second thing, the first thing was lazy or apathetic. The second thing is sport becomes king. Uh, more and more, um, not only just sport like um, kids playing sport, but like your activities that you like to do. It could be you chase the sun. It could be the lake. It could be camping. It could be Netflix. It could be just your comfy pajamas, and that's the sport that you choose. It could be the beach. And um, my, my kids... Um, play sports, and oftentimes we have to choose what do we do with sports on Sunday. It's getting harder and harder uh, in the community we live in, and I think in just the country we live in. And my kids are good at sports. I'm learning that my kids are good. Um, they're, they're excelling at sports. And, oh, man, you parents out there, you know what it's like to see your kid excel at something. There are very few things in life that give you that dopamine hit, like seeing your kid do something great. And it could be in academics. It could be their first job. It could be that they built something. You go, I didn't know my kid had that, and now I see it, and there is nothing that fills you in that way, right? And so I, you know, I saw my, my oldest daughter win state in track. You know what it's like to see your, your kid excel at that, that level, at that setting, at a world-class, you know, a, you know, venue in Eugene, you go, that's my kid. I could watch that all day, every day. Give me some more to see uh, my other kids um, excel, to see them play state in, in baseball and hit doubles and score runners or pitch a game when their team needs it and they come through in the clutch or to see my younger daughter hit a grand slam this, this spring in, in softball. You're just going like, that's my kid. And I'm going to pretend like it's not a big deal, but inside, I'm going crazy. <laughs> and I want people to come up to me and go, that was your kid. They're great. And I can say to myself, it comes from me. <laughs> I can trick myself to think I could really run as fast as my daughter. Or hit as good as my... No, they're all better than me. Sport becomes king. The third one, so lazy or apathetic sport or, or activity and leisure becomes king. Uh, let me go back here. The third one is we, we become consumers. We live in a consumeristic world, and we bring that to church with us. It's not only what is it, what's in this for me mentality that we bring to church. It's also what works for me. We come to church based on what it does for me, what it provides for me, who's preaching. Uh, we've never been so open and uh, had so many preachers available to us. You can watch much better preachers than what we provide at Foothills. You could stay at home. You could tune in to Athey Creek or Matt Chandler in Texas or some big guy down in California, whatever your fan, you know, fits you, but that is not the same as being in your local church. It's just not. There is no substitute to being in the local church and to gathering with people. Those things can supplement your life. I don't hear me say you shouldn't watch those or, you know, listen to, to something on your way to work, whatever, but they are supplemental. They are not the church. Um, Peter goes into this, and we'll kind of make our way here. For in, in Scripture, it says 
this, this stone, this cornerstone. I see I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Uh, let me share a couple of pictures. I'll move through these quickly. This is a picture of part of the old Jerusalem wall. This is from when my wife and I were in Jerusalem. So this is looking at different layers that have been built up. This is super high. This is stories high. I made some markings here with my, my phone, kind of my finger. I don't know if you've ever done that on a photo, but uh, the, the bedrock you can see there on the left, there's some on the right, and then those stones at the bottom, those are 200 BC. Those, are fr- those were laid in 200 BC. That's before Jesus came, right? The next layer is 100 AD, about 1,000 years after Jesus walked. And then the very top, it might be a little hard for you to see on the screen, but that's 1500 AD. These are layers of stones. The ones on the bottom, and maybe I'll talk some more about this tonight, those are cut so precise and stacked so neatly, there's no mortar in them. There's nothing holding them together. That's how tight that construction was. And then you can see some more uh, mortar as you kind of make your way up. Paul has these, or Peter has these th- kind of things in mind, these structures in mind, these ancient building by, you know, block by block by block st- structures. It's not like your house, at least not what you see. Maybe you went down to the foundation, the corner, the corner of your um, foundation, but that's all poured, right? It's all one big piece. You have to get your mind wrapped around this idea of stone by stone buildings were getting built. This is the corner, one of the corners of the Temple Mount. And um, this one stone, I wrote some notes down as we were traveling, is, is about 30 feet long and about three feet high. Hard to tell in this picture. You can actually go under the, the Temple Mount. You can see the guys that I'm walking behind. You can see that one stone that starts kind of above that guy's um, hat and then goes well above him. That's another one of those stones. This is actually underground. We're walking through a tunnel. And it took me 10 steps to walk from one end of the stone to the other. This is the kind of stones that Peter has in mind when he is quoting scripture and saying, uh, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. The one who trusts in him, he's talking about Jesus, will never be put to shame. He, he goes from here and he says, now, to you who believe this is, this, this is the, the precious stone, who believe this stone is precious, um, you believe that. Those who believe believe this is a precious stone. But those who do not believe, the stone the, rejectors, uh, the builders rejected has become the capstone. And the stone that causes men to stumble, a stone or a rock that makes them fall. He says they, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Let me break this down like this. Uh, The point of this little section is Jesus is the cornerstone. And he, uh, Peter describes it this way. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. The one who sets Jesus as the cornerstone in his life, the church that sets Jesus as the cornerstone of their life and builds off of him as the foundational piece for their structure of life, as the house of God and in your individual life, you will never be put to shame. You might think Jesus has, uh, has um, left or not been worthy for you to build your life on, but at the end of the day, you will never be put to shame. The world might try to put you to shame. Circumstances might try to deceive your mind into thinking Jesus wasn't worthy of being the cornerstone, but Peter wants to remind you that he is worthy, and if you put your trust in him, you will not be put to shame. He says, to you who believe, Jesus is precious. To you who believe, you understand that Jesus occupies that cornerstone of the life that you're building of faith and the life of our church. And he says, you understand that he is precious. There's no one precious. He is unique. He's the only one worthy. He's the one who sets the foundation of faith in our lives and in our church. Those who trust him, that's what you're trusting in. But those who do not believe, this is what he says, Jesus is a stone that causes men to stumble. They stumble because they disobey the message. What's the message? Is that Jesus is the cornerstone of your life. Some of us, even in the room, we don't live as if Jesus is the cornerstone of our life. And when you do that, this is what Peter says about you. You're a, uh, Jesus has become a stone to you. You don't understand it. He's a stumbling block to you. You stub your toe on him and go, why is that there? This is in the way of my life. Not only that, he uses this kind of imagery. They stumble because they disobey the message of who Jesus is. 
you might even be here today, this morning, and thinking uh, a lot about Jesus or trying to figure out who he is. And Peter would say to you, and I would encourage you to adopt this as well, that Jesus is the cornerstone of all life. And if you live outside of him being that cornerstone, it will always be a stumbling block. Your life of, of supposed faith will never be real faith. And you are disobeying the message that has been revealed in Scripture. And maybe today is the opportunity. Maybe today you go, I, I want to know what it doesn't mean for Jesus to be the cornerstone of my life, to build my life on him, to put every single piece of frame of the structure I'm building my life on, on Jesus as the cornerstone, the first block that gets laid, to wipe everything clean and say, Jesus, you're the cornerstone. I believe in you. I believe in your life. I believe in your death. I believe in your resurrection. I believe you paid for my sins. I believe what you said is true. I believe you're the miracle worker. I believe you can take people from life to death. I believe you secured a place for me in heaven forevermore. I believe your kingdom has come. I want to put you at the cornerstone of my life. I want to believe in that. I want to see you as precious as the most unique stone that I can build my life on. The third musing is this. There's no... Uh, excuse me, there's no substitute for being my local church. Sorry, the fourth one is, is this. It is, always has been, and always will be about Jesus. Yes. And I, I got to tell you, it, it is so encouraging to come back to church and for the life of the church to continue on very well without me. I think it's a beautiful sign of a healthy church. That tells me we've got a chance at keeping Jesus as the cornerstone. That some of you don't know who I am. You've, you've come to church while I've been gone, and you're part of a church that keeps Jesus as the cornerstone. That people are growing in their faith, and it's not about me or another personality on stage. It's about Jesus. Jesus is the one who can change your life. Jesus is the one who can change your affections and change your mind about who you are and who he is and the world you live in. That's Jesus that can do that. I can't do that. I get to just point to him. Our worship team just gets to exalt him, and hopefully you fix your eyes on who Jesus is, because this church has always been, always will be, is currently about Jesus. What a good thing. It's very good for me to come back and go, the church is still going. <laughs> Take me out of the picture. Put someone else in. It's all about Jesus. Last thing that, that Peter mentions is these couple verses. I'm not going to really teach through these, but I just want you to listen to them and just let them sink in if you can. You, the church, are a, royal, a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You are chosen, you're royal, you're a priesthood. You've been called out of darkness into light. You weren't a people of God, and now you are. You haven't received mercy, but now you have. That's all based on the work of Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection, and him being the cornerstone of your life, him being the cornerstone of our church, the living stone, and all of us being built up into the house of God. What a wonderful, encouraging, and beautiful picture for us to lean into. I'll have more to share next week, and so I hope, hopefully you'll uh, get to sit with me in what I've been chewing on and thinking through. Um, but for now, let's, let's do what we've been doing uh, this summer. Let's circle up. I've got a question for you. This is designed for you to have a little discussion with someone you came with, um, or maybe you might have to conjure up some courage and, and talk to someone uh, if you came solo. Uh, maybe this is for you and your family to have a little discussion. Here's the question. How can Jesus be the cornerstone of your life? Maybe it's just a reminder to fix your eyes back on him and set him back up as your cornerstone. Maybe this is a first-time endeavor. So that's the question. I've got two minutes Put a little music on and go ahead and have a discussion. We'll come back up and sing.
All right. Let's uh, wrap up our conversations. We're going to have hopefully many more conversations on the ride home and today. But for now, let's stand and let's sing together. been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I 
Help us to keep our eyes firmly fixed on that. Lord, not on all the things around us that the enemy wants us to pay more attention to than you. God, help us to keep you as the cornerstone of our life, God. The, the point we always come back to and say, is, is this right? Does this line up with the way that you want me to live my life? Father, help us. There are so many things trying to point us in so many different directions, Lord, but help us to keep centered, grounded, and rooted in you. God, strengthen us through your spirit to do so. Give us the ability to see through the lies of the enemy. And God, give us uh, strength and power to go forward 
uh, and, and tell this world about you, about the one thing in life that makes everything make sense, gives all things purpose, and the one who holds all things together. God, thank you. We look to you in hope today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. It's been a pleasure, a joy to be with you today. We'll see you back here next week.